The Sunday Papers on Off The Ball. Welcome to the Sunday Paper Review on Off The Ball. John Duggan with you this morning, uh, sitting in for Joe Malloy, and we're joined by the Irish Independent sports writer, Michael Verney, and the Irish Daily Mail sports reporter, Philip Quinn, to review the stories of the day. Michael and Philip, you're both very welcome to the show. John, how are you? Good to be here, John. Great lads, great to be alive, great to be here. Absolutely, lovely yeah. morning. I was just thinking to make that earlier. If it was a different, maybe next weekend we could be talking about the one of our great sporting events we all love is the Entry Grand National. But uh, maybe we'll get invited back to talk about that. But uh, we might be pick a winner out if we were lucky. But well, the Masters would probably be a bigger deal as well. If it's an Irish lad next week Wouldn't in contention, that be you know, a yeah. Rory or a yeah. Shane yeah. on the top of the leaderboard going into the Sunday, you'll have the breakfast or you'll have the the late that's in Carvery and everything. To yeah, there's you're... nothing like that buzz. If you're, I remember staying up when I was in a young fella for. Faldo and Norman and thinking that Norman was going to get his hands on the Masters Trophy. What are we looking at? 1996. 1996, yeah. He's been six ahead to five behind. That's right, yeah. yeah. He had three near misses, Greg, in the, in the, in the US yeah, Masters. The and Saturday Slam, 1996, he had all the Saturday night leads mm. in all four majors, only won one of them. Yeah. And now he's causing carnage <laughs> outside of his own yeah. playing career. Without even being there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, next weekend, hopefully, there's four Irish in the Masters, and there's, a, there's a, a possibly five, John, if Paulie Carrington can do the business in Texas today. Well, that's it. Um, so look, I can't wait for that and quite wait for that in the discussion as well on the pay-per-view. Let's go through the back pages, folks, in the sports supplements. So, um, last man standing, Leinster fly the flag uh, as Ulster, Munster and Connacht bow out. That's the Sunday independent sport. Jubilant Pep denies Liverpool disrespects the city manager under fire for exuberant goal celebration. So he denied he disrespected Liverpool after celebration wildly in front of subs Acosta, Simicast and Arthur Mello during the 4-1 victory at the Etihad Stadium yesterday. Uh, we have Paul Kim and Shane Larry on his Masters countdown. That's coming up in the discussion later on. Sunday Times Sport, Man City thrashed Liverpool to keep the pressure on Arsenal. No Haddon, no problem. Julian Alvarez, excellent yesterday. Attack on Liverpool bus, the City condemned fan chants. So this disgusting stuff still going on. So police investigating that object was hurled at the Liverpool team coach believed to be a brick, a crack in the glass rather than shattering it. And then also chants related to the Hillsborough disaster were audible from some of the home supporters during the first half. Liverpool say they're sickened by the chants. Manchester City very disappointed to hear these chants and regretting any offence uh, they may have caused. Fergus Lattery will touch on this in a fascinating interview by David Walsh in the Sunday Times. Kind of a heartbreaking one, to be honest. Dementia and rugby mm. read his family's moving story. Back in the Sunday world. Clop of the flops. Liverpool boss vows to dump players and get new signings in the summer. Spillane return of Cluxton is a joke. This is ahead of the Division 2 final Derry in Dublin today. Ten Hag delighted with Fernandes. Farrell's keeper, Delena. Absolutely shocking by the Reds, says John Aldridge about Liverpool. United can edge at Magpies. We have the game live on Newstalk and off the ball half four this afternoon. Newcastle Man U at the St James's Park. The Sun, I'm Johnny Cash. Johnny Sexton trying to drum, drum up support for Leinster against Leicester. Good Friday at the Viva. Don't think there'll be an issue with the crowd there. A ray of light for the Breffney Cavan winning the Division 3 final. Eric, new five year contract, Eric Ten Hag. Sorry, Pep's sarcastic apology after goading subs. City contempt, brick up attack on Clop Bus. Cop Bus, even. And we got the mirror rivals go for it. Man City and Arsenal about winning 4 1. Man United bid. This is a nonsense story, I have to say. Zillicus wants combined effort to seize Old Trafford from the Glazers. Not going to happen. This is more interesting. Spurs KO for Poch return. Tottenham have told Mauricio Pochettino to forget about a return to his old club. I think there's probably more legs than that one. Your paper, Philip the Mail. Uh, Blue Wave, Ulster washed away at Leinster. Power as of uh, Munster and Ireland women suffer demoralising defeats. So the Irish women can shipped 53 points. The Munster team, 50. In the swing, McElroy in the mix for Augusta Glory, along with Scheffler and Ram. And we'll get to Matt Cooper's article as well about the FAI Shortly, you're Man City. I, I don't know if we're allowed to say your allegiance, Philip, but... Um, oh, well, John, I mean, you're Spurs, so of course yeah. we are. <laughs> um, look, it was great yesterday, and there's probably two elements of it. There's the title race, which is absolutely fascinating, with two months to go. Uh, there's Pep um, as well. I just think he's a bit of an ass on the sideline at times, Pep. Uh, but that's just his, his personality. He's an amazing manager. And then Liverpool themselves, their issues, and the, the amount of remedial work that Jurgen Klopp's going to have to do now on that. Oh, Liverpool are, are miles off it. I'm just, um, yeah, I, 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 I'm a City fan. I'm also a League of Ireland fan. I have a League of Ireland allegiance as well, John. But uh, um, I thought, you know, reading Roy Curtis in the Sunday World, uh, Roy makes a point that um, you know, there was no challenge yesterday and were City, were City going to be vulnerable possibly to, to, to Liverpool? Could Liverpool make a charge, get into that top four play, position? And I thought, Roy hits it there on the head. He said, Julian Alvarez just stepped out of the shadows and it was outstanding. People all said it was Jack Grealish and it was, you know, the John Stones in midfield. But I thought actually Alvarez uh, led the line superbly and um, 
he provided a different type of uh, a threat and um, a small man he was nipping in and out between Virgil van Dijk who looks bewildered to be honest with you, compared to the peerless defender he was a couple of years ago um, City went, went behind and, and won 4-1 and it could have been 6 or 7 one. but yeah a lot of talk about a couple of things uh, leave the result to one side which basically you know puts Liverpool in a very bad position for, for top four and I thought they were going to get that I'm not so sure now uh, Guardiola um, you say he's a bit of an ass on the sidelines a lot of managers are ass on the sidelines I think yeah. Jurgen Klopp is a bit of an ass on the sideline and beating his chest going towards the, the, the Anfield Cup that wouldn't be something that I, I think is Mourinho yeah. doing the slide Mourinho doing the slide tackles, tackles yeah, well, yeah. yeah. You, you, your, your old pal Conte has just left he was a bit of an ass on the sidelines as well but the handshake remember the handshake between himself and Tuchel that was actually this season could you believe yeah. it and they're both gone yeah. Yeah, yeah. and Tuchel's now bounced back at, at Bayern, Bayern Munich, Munich. Conte be, won't be as easy for Conte try to bring uh, Pep down but uh, yeah, I, there's a timing and thing. I, I I saw what happened on the sideline, Guardiola. You know, was he out of line? Well, first of all, he was turning around to celebrate with his son, which he always does after a goal. I think it was the third goal. And it was it was a by the way, City it was four, the equaliser. N- no, no, it wasn't the equaliser. Was it? No, 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 it was in the second half because it was it was at that day. It was it was, it was in the second half. I think it was the third goal. All City's goals, by the way, were from open play, so they actually can't even pull apart. There were no set pieces goals, and I think it was just the, the purity of the goal. He was he, he does love pure goals, um, but the Liverpool lads were just happened to be walking back from their from their their, their warm up at that at that end, and they walked past straight past. Guardiola as he was jumping up and down it, it, you know it, I think it was mischievous at, at, at best it was a little bit disrespectful yeah I, w- I wouldn't like it I mean I was just saying to, to, to Mick uh, Mick played inter-county hurling like you know and if he was on the line for Offaly which he was in a famous match in Ballycran and he's, I say he's playing Kilkenny and they just scored a goal and you're walking back from your warm up Mick and the Kilkenny manager Brian Cody shakes his hand out to you because Kilkenny have scored a goal what would you do? Oh to be a dunt I'd say don't. Or don't. Yeah, there probably would be. Yeah. The good thing is Brian Cody would never do that. No, he'd never do that. No, definitely not. But I just I was thinking in the GA context, even in a club game, like there'd definitely be it'd be like two bulls running into each there'd other. Probably be the both dressing rooms then jumping in and everything, which you, been, you yeah. don't have in soccer. Well, they should, they should, maybe they should have. I, yeah, I, I, I think he could have been nice something there, Guardiola. But Liverpool were, were, were at that stage with three other caved in. I think one of the lads shook hands with him. Was it, was it Arthur actually? Yeah, yeah, one of them did. Yeah. Shook hands, eventually, yeah. eventually, yeah, eventually, yeah, reluctantly. I, I don't think. I think Guardiola would be good advice to do that again. If that was, you know, Man United players walking by, I, I'm surprised, as Mick says, it didn't lead to something a bit more, you know. Um, but in the context of what was serious in terms of what wasn't particularly pleasant uh, what happened after the game I think the stoning of the Liverpool bus by City there's a rivalry there that's, that's got nasty and I'm a City fan and I've always liked Liverpool I've always admired their, their from the Shankly days and I've, always, I've been to Anfield it's a great ground and um, a lot of great Irish players have played for that great club over the years but this, the, the Liverpool United intensity is still there but Liverpool City has got a bit nasty mm. you know it happened at the Champions League match a couple of years ago the City bus was stoned now you're having City fans allegedly chanting about Hillsborough that does no place for that in, 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 in football or in sport um, and that needs to be, to, be, to be ironed out pretty quickly because that can't go on that, that's bitter and it's unnecessary I think there was a brick thrown at the Liverpool bus um, and unless it's ironed it out Philip it, it only gets more bitter yeah. as well the next thing will be you know escalated even play, more when the, again, when the next yeah. play again you know uh, but if you take a step back John and you know you, you know your you know your football Liverpool are a shadow where they were before you but know? they can't they can't do the Gagan press anymore because the Gagan press needs complete fuel and energy, energy and, they and, and, and they don't have that anymore do you, or they do, have it yeah. inconsistently is there a like how long can you do that with the same players before players eventually are we talking out? a four to five year span yeah. like how many teams did Ferguson have four teams Ferguson, Ferguson always bought a new player every year and the lads who won the league said well, Grant we're, we're to go again next year and someone would arrive in the dressing room and they'd be oh I'm gone like Paul Ince couldn't believe it when Roy Keane arrived Galskis, Inch you know, Hughes players, players were moved on moved on I Roy think Keane the, was moved on the, yeah eventually and Roy was probably past his best at that stage when he had the big falling out but Liverpool's midfield is, is too old you know Fabinho and Henderson excellent professionals I think also last year I think Van Dijk is the player he was as well but I think last year, John, they were two matches away from doing something. Everything, that, that the whole, no whole club, sweep. The mm. clean sweep, the, the grand slam of football, which will never be, would probably never be done in our times. And I think that just, they didn't realise when they started again, they were, they were back down at the bottom of Everest and had to climb up again. They nearly got to the peak last year. I think mentally, they're just not, not, not where they were last year. And the legs in the midfield are gone as well. Um, it needs a complete overhaul. Will Klopp be the man to do it, do you think? Well, I think he should get the opportunity. Mm. Uh, because I think Klopp has got a symbiotic re- relationship with the city and the people. And he's very much part of the soul I think of the city and the club so I think he, he needs to have the opportunity to do it yeah. now I know football is much more cutthroat these days um, but he is probably the biggest figure and I, I know Paisley won a lot of titles but in terms of the presence he's probably, Shankly, the, yeah. probably the biggest figure since Shankly, Shankly yeah. the mm. concern is John Liverpool uh, as it stands in the league table now are falling behind Brentford and Brighton 
they may not make the Champions League. You know, Spurs. It's, it's, it's unlikely. Spurs beat Everton tomorrow. I would say that Newcastle night. and Man United are the favourites to be in the Champions League spots, but Spurs are probably the next next, next one after team. that. Yeah. So what happens then? What to happens re- at, recruiting player well, in the well, summer? Well, who well, wants to go to a club? Well, like, that's it. The Champions League. Yeah, unless it's the draw. Liverpool is a global brand, and what it means as a club. Like I think it's a really the proof of the pudding will be if Jude Bellingham doesn't go to Liverpool. And, and if we go somewhere else, really that'll be not a good city. Because we when, when Liverpool were earning everything a few years ago, we were talking about it, Mbappe was speaking of his admiration mm-hmm. of Liverpool. There's not a hope in a million years now Mbappe would join Liverpool. And that's where how this, the sands have shifted. And also yesterday, it was a half 12 game. Normally it's be half four, Man City Liverpool. It was the rivalry. It was the global game the last few years. Now it's not. Yeah. Now the rivalry has changed. It could be Arsenal City, it could be other clubs, it could be Newcastle City in the five years' time. Yeah. I think Liverpool have a terrible record in those half twelve games as well. This year. Yes. Someone said that, losing to Bournemouth and others. Just yeah. on the on yeah. the style of play, yeah. uh, it's kinda you can kind of make some parallels with say a Davy Fitzgerald team in Hurland, shall we say. There's a shelf life that's usually talked about because of the physical demands that are placed on them or whatever. And like at least within a club you have the opportunity of bringing in new players within a county you're operating on the same with you know with the same pool of players but it'd be fascinating to see you know what way they go about it I only have a passing interest in soccer I'll be honest but it'd be fascinating to see how he rebuilds if he is the I'd imagine he's the one to rebuild given as you say what the season was like last year so it'd be fascinating to see what chess piece he's going to move who he's going to get in as you say with the lack of Champions League football it would have been unlikely probably at this stage who will he actually be able to draw in now at this stage as well so it's going to be fascinating to see how they do rebuild there's so many aspects to it recruitment is such a huge thing oh, yeah. like Alvarez is talking it cost 14 million pounds they bought him early they bought him before the World Cup so, last so year so the recruitment's right at City mm-hmm. Uh, uh, whereas I look at Tottenham the club I support the recruitment has been shambolic Everton the recruitment has been shambolic Man United under Woodward the recruitment was really bad and the wage structure was, was all over the shop mm. so it's fascinating all the other things that need to go into Michael Edwards has left Liverpool Klopp needs all these other people around him just as much as he needs himself mm. Mm. but it's like a horse trainer say like Willie Mullins he has all the stars now but he has to be planning for what are the next stars coming in so the Liverpool team last year was brilliant and they were flying but you know how is that gonna? How is he gonna adapt, or how is he gonna change? He didn't probably think far enough ahead to think, God, I'm gonna need an awful lot of energy next year, given what they've expended this year. And now he's left with a lot of, you know, players that were brilliant last year, but they are now flat and legless in some respects. You'd have to say. Yeah. It's gonna the, re- the only consolation, John, uh, for those who follow Liverpool, and there's a huge Irish support for Liverpool as there is for Everton, is things aren't as bad there as they are at Chelsea. You could do an hour and a half on that on Chelsea. How much money have they thrown at the club? And then the bottom half of the mm-hmm. Premier League. Bottom half of the Premier League. I'm sorry. Harry Potter. Graham Potter. You know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, Mighty Potter might be the one that... Mighty <laughs> Potter, Speaking yeah. of racehorses, might be the one to get him out of trouble. Yeah, but Chelsea are I, I, I just think he's got an impossible job. But you're, you're, here's, 30, here's 30 new players. And he's, he, doesn't, he doesn't buy them. Deal they're with bought, it. They're bought for him. Yeah, and, and like, it's not that they had major injuries yesterday. Like, uh, you had Mudrick was playing. You had Felix playing. So they paid for him? Uh, all of these players. And Aston Villa, Unai Emery. Just shows, like... They got rid of Danny Ings, Aston Villa. They have a clear uh, plan to what they do in terms of their setup of the team. One two nil yesterday. So, mm. I think Chelsea ended up with a centre half and and two full backs as playing as centre halves. I think Chilwell and Cookerell are ended up or ended up as centre halves. Chelsea seem a mess. Yeah. So for all the difficulties that Liverpool are having, uh, and and your own Spurs, um, who have the measure of Man City, things at Chelsea are, they are in a, what was it? they're in a heap. The word make sheep and a heap, a heap, a heap. <laughs> a heap. Um, Tommy Conlon in the Sunday Independent, yeah. just on Ireland. I'm just going to go read some of the quotes here. Uh, those Irish players are absolutely tremendous against what's probably their strongest team in world football. This is against France last Monday in the Euro qualifier. We lost 1 0. They were forced to operate at or near the maximum capacity from first minute until last. When Theo Hernandez played in Adrian Rabio down the left hand corner, Jason Malumbi arrived to make the sliding tackle and terminate the threat. The crowd reaction was thunderous and channeling the theatrics of his fellow Waterfordian. The great John Milan, Malumbi responded by giving the clenched fists back to the cheering masses. It did your heart good to see it. And if there's a layer of creativity missing, it might have something to do with the fact that the Irish midfield is a West Brom of the second division, Malumbi, Burnley of the second division, Cullen, and Derby County of the third division, Knight. Do people expect miracles? Lourdes is in the south of France, that lands down road, and he finishes with, there's something stirring in the national side. It is taking more time than anyone would like, as Agbeni said, but the seeds of a proper revival have been planted and are starting to grow. Philip, you're on the Irish beat. I am. Uh, I also will quote Matt Cooper here in the Sunday Business Post. FAI needs a result in the search for a team sponsor. What do people expect of the Irish men's football team? This is a question that applies as much to potential sponsors as to the fans. 
or those former managers who were critical of the team's performance in the 1-0 defeat to France at the Viva last Monday night, which most fans seem to think was brave given the golfing class between the players available to both sides. For the men's team, a new badge for the national jersey has been launched as part of a rebranding and that jersey will be made by Castor, but the FAI can't get a new sponsor for the men's team. He adds, the problem for the FAI is that despite the brave display against France last Monday, there's limited confidence about the progression of Stephen Kenny's team and the likelihood of qualifying for the Euros. He's won nine of the 32 games he's been in charge of since April 2020, missing out on European Championship and World Cup qualification in that period. None of the games featuring Kenny's sides made the top 50 most watched TV programmes in 2022, unthinkable since the Jack Charlton era began in 1986. Discuss? Yes. Uh, well, the, well, the first thing I say, sitting here in the studio, I'm looking at a bank of jerseys opposite me here. I can see a Kerry Group logo. I can see Elvery's logo. I can see Vodafone logo. Uh, and I can see Sky logo on the Irish women's jersey. And the Irish men's jersey has nothing on it. When they announced the Castore sponsorship last week, um, a huge deal, by the way, for the FAI, running into high teens of millions, could even could even get to 20 million over six years, which is, it really is the best kit deal they've ever had. And they unveiled all the players and there were, there were graphics and they had male players and female players all together. You can see the lady players all had a sponsor on the jersey and the male, men, men didn't. And I just don't get this. I, don't, I just cannot understand. Is that how, you know, sort of septic the men's team is to the commercial world? How much are they looking for? Are they over looking for too much? I just don't get it. I don't know why someone hasn't uh, come on board. But maybe, maybe after Monday, people are... Uh, after Monday's game, there might be a change of, of mind uh, in, in, on the commercial side of it. Someone might decide to take a punt, um, and they should. Um, it was probably the best performance under Kenny. I always set the bar by Kenny was the Portugal game away, where we led 1-0 89 minutes and we lost 2-1 Ronaldo. Um, that performance on Monday probably eclipsed it. Uh, we lost. Always hard to take it when you play well and you lose, and you, you know that, you know, uh, but the ledger says zero points. Um, and if you look at it, you know, baldly, and I have a bald head, if you look at the stats, the figures, you know, you know, we're not in a good position in terms of the group. France are going to come first. We're going to have to battle very hard to come second. You know, we've struggled to be competitive in any competitive campaign, in any qualification campaign under Kenny. We have struggled to be competitive. But we were competitive on Monday night. Um, and did we deserve a draw? I thought we probably did actually on the night. What I didn't see coming, and I made the point in the Daily Mail that before the game, I could see Ireland... Ha- I actually thought we might actually get a draw, and I made the reason why. We had an extra run-in, two days less, uh, t- more, two days more to prepare. France had to travel. France had played Holland on Friday night. I may have thought, that's the hard game out of the way for the weekend. So it's only a little old Ireland. We were ready for them. We were in the trenches ready for them. Kenny did say the thing about ice and fire, and he got that bang on. Um, but for 70 minutes... We, we were just, it was containment, and then we suddenly found this late hurrah, this late, fifth, late late surge, and we were excellent, and but for the keeper we would have got a draw, and we deserved a draw. But where does it leave us in terms of the overall group? One last thing I will say, John, and it was a, it was an excellent performance, but I often, I believe with this, should we have been playing France at all? And this, this goes back to my point that I've been making in the Irish Daily Mail for a while. When Kenny took over, we were second seeds. We were, we... We dropped to the third seeds because we couldn't beat Bulgaria at home in a Nations League game. So we got Serbia in the World Cup. We would have avoided them. We got France in the Euros. We would have avoided them had we been a second seed. So the progress that we're making is slow. And even like Benny talks about here, about a winning mentality won't happen overnight. But we need to start winning matches that matter because we need to get our seeding up. So we avoid playing France. So we avoid heroic Do you see enough defeats. encouragement on Monday to, to, to feel that we can get more consistency into the team now? Well, consistency has been a problem under Kenny. Every time we take a step forward, we take a step back. You know, we've had six really, really big matches under Kenny. The big matches, the six big matches we've had were Slovakia in the Euros, Portugal away home, Serbia home and away, and France at home in the Euros, and we haven't won any of them. I wouldn't expect us to win three of them, but we might have won one or won, won two. So we need to find a way to win the matches. And Greece in June is, is huge for Kenny, you know, because the Irish team, if they bring that level of, of, of performance to Greece on in June, they can win it. And they must win that game because we have to be competitive in this group. France are home and hoes for first. Second place, it looks like it's the Dutch, it's ourselves, it's Greece. We have to be competitive. And if we're going to be competitive in the group uh, come September when we play France and Holland in the same week, we have to win in Greece. And if we play like that, I think we have every chance. I, I, was, I was heartened by the performance, if not by the result. Just on the um, the figures you pulled out there that none of the games were in the top 50 most watched or whatever, I would have fallen into that because it would only be a casual follower. And I tuned in the other night and I have to say I thought it was thoroughly enjoyable. Uh, even the way they were trying to play, uh, it was a lot more positive. I'd say it was a lot more modern with what you're seeing in the Premier League most weeks. They were trying to play the ball out. Now, fair enough, they got caught for the goal as a result of doing that. That's probably 
trying to maybe overplay uh, and maybe get into safer positions before you play like that. But they are good to watch, I have to say. And they came with a little flurry before half time, and then with this unbelievable flurry coming up to full time. And I would agree with with Quinner like they probably deserve to get a point out of it. And uh, the attitude or the attitude is quite positive from what I, from what I can gather, but it would be even more positive had they got a point. The fascinating thing I want to see now is when they play Greece, uh, how does the approach, how does the shape, how does the game plan change when you're you're not containing now. Mm. You're going to try. And, yeah, you're going to try and get points. You need to get foot. points on the board. Yeah, so uh, there was only one. There was only one up top. Was there the other night? Um, Ferguson. Yeah. Ferguson. Ferguson. Yeah. Ferguson yeah. Need so like, wide is it, right. Is it, a, is it a two up top the next night? Uh, Ogbeni was brilliant. I thought as well, just in his role throughout. Yeah, yeah, but I just it'd be interesting to see how does the how does the style change when the the needs have changed now? Shall we say they need to probably need to at least get a draw, possibly get three points on the board. Do you feel, Philip, that it's uh, he's got to qualify Stephen Kenny to be leading us into the World Cup? Campaign? I think so, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. He's it's, it's, it, this is the third year of his anniversary of his appointment. I think it was April twenty twenty, and um, you know a huge goodwill behind him, including myself, despite what some people think, um, wanting to do well and encouraging and supporting the brand of football that he wanted to bring in. You know, we all want to see a more possession based game. You know, the old sort of knock it long um, days. We, we wanted to didn't want that as being the staple diet. I actually think he's he's changed a little bit. I think he's mixed it up a little bit. Um, uh, the tactics are not as uh, what, what uh, we're not passing the ball across the back just as we used to willy nilly. With us a bit more, a bit more sort of a, a bit more variety in our play. But I do think he has to qualify for the Euros because if he doesn't, he'll have had four campaigns. And you could include the the, the Euro semi finals playoff, which we lost as well. Um, so yeah, now he's got a couple of chances of qualifying, John, because with the playoffs as well, and I think that's intriguing. We could be involved in the playoffs next March. And I think Kenny will still be manager if, through the Nations League. Through the Nations yes. League, with there's twelve slots, difficult to qualify for that. Twelve, twelve teams qualify. Twelve teams go for three places. If we're competitive in this group up to the very end, and by I mean the very end, that means the last game away to Holland in November. If we're still in with a chance of coming second at that point, then I think Kenny will stay on for the for the playoffs. Playoffs 12, 12 for three. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a good return, uh, but it gives him a chance. But if if after that we haven't qualified, then I think. And the FA will make a decision it's time to go down a different road and um, Kenny probably can't argue with it he's had 22 competitive matches he's got another 7 in this campaign and possibly another 2 or 2 in the in the playoffs so you know he's had plenty of matches um, but as I see every time we take a step forward is it a false dawn because we, we rarely follow up a good performance with another good one what about the argument that we don't have the players we don't have the players comparable like last Monday we had 5 players playing top flight football and only 3 of them a Bazunu um, Colin. Coleman and uh, who the other one? Well, Collins uh, is another one, but he, he's been in no, he's not. No, no, it was, uh, it was um, so it was Bazunu, no, Bazunu, Coleman, and Ferguson, the only pl- players who are playing regular first team football, and where you've got a, a host of Champions League winning players on the opposition team that probably the best team in Europe on the basis of reaching the World Cup final. Um, are we are we expecting too much, I suppose, from an Irish yeah, team? That's, well. Well, Kenny always says that his ambition is to qualify for, for major tournaments. And I think the European Championships is one that we should qualify for. Yeah, I think it's achievable. Like Nearly half the teams in yeah. Europe can qualify for yeah. the Euros. So I, do, I do think it's achievable. Maybe just though with the group. The group is so difficult. You've got the third and sixth ranked well, teams in the world. Well, we shouldn't be second seeds then. We shouldn't yeah, be third yeah. seeds. That goes back to my point. But yeah, 24 teams... 20, 20 teams qualify out of the groups automatically, plus Germany, that's 21, and you get three from the playoffs. Yeah. And there it's are only just about 50, uh, 53, 54 nations. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, 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 so you really should be qualifying for the Euros. We should for the, Euro, the World Cup is, is difficult. I think there's only yes. 13 teams qualify for that. It'll be a bit more next time around because they're expanding the tournament to 48 teams. So yeah, we should qualify for the Euros. So yeah, so for Kenny, the Nations League is kind of, look, you're looking to go up. We didn't go up either time. The World Cup is hard to qualify. Uh, are we in a harder group for the Euros than we were for the World Cup? I would say we possibly are France and Holland as opposed to Serbia and, Holland, Serbia and Portugal. But yeah, Kenny has to qualify for the Euros because we should. We're a team. Even with those players you mentioned, we should be qualifying for the European Championships. Um, without any, if we can't make the top twenty-four in Europe, we should all throw our hat at it. Can I just come in on that, John? There's not a you know when you look back at the great team of the noughties or you know the qualified for you know big finals. There's not a Duff. There's not a Keane. There's not all these really recognisable faces that were playing you know Premier League every week, week in week out with big teams. Keane at United, Duff with Chelsea, uh, Robbie Keane be it at Inter Milan or be it at uh, he was at Spurs Leeds. obviously as well. You know at Leeds as well. You know a lot of guys really big marquee names playing with really big teams playing in you know. Champions League semi-finals finals fighting it out for Premier Leagues we don't have that at the moment so to me I think Kenny is doing a pretty decent job with what he has at his disposal that, 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 that's what it all comes down to is Kenny 
getting the best out of what he has. Mm. We don't have as mixed as we don't have what we had under 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 Charles and, and to a certain degree under McCarthy up to 2002 and a little bit beyond. So is Kenny getting the best out of what we have? If people think that he is, then he stays there. Is the is there an argument that another manager might get a little bit more? Then that's something that maybe should be up for discussion. And the FA will have to consider this because they've got sponsorship considerations and you know they they the team you know the Euros is is is, is the bottom line really. You know we were there in 2012. Under trap, okay, we were injured when we got there. We were and we were, we were home before the postcards. We were there in 2016. Didn't have a great Scott in 2016 either, but we put it up to France in in the last 16 match and we were leading one nil at half time and they were they were they were they weren't entirely comfortable. So I, I think we can get to the Euros mm. even with the, the players that we have and we have got some decent players. Can I just ask you really quickly on the jersey sponsor? Is that a legacy thing with? You know what yeah. the FAI has been yeah. through the last. Yeah, the FAI are people won't touch it. It's a toxic brand. Okay, it's a toxic okay. brand. Which is but, being rehabilitated. But, right but the now. ladies have done well. You know, under Poe, and that's one a, of them. That's an excellent brand. Yeah, and one of the things about the ladies is John. And again, make this is really, Vera Poe doesn't play possession based football. She doesn't pass it. Oh, out she's Jack back. Charlton. Mark she's too. Jack Charlton. Uh, they've won the last four games. I think by they kept a clean sheet. They won three of them one nil and one. So that's two, the results yeah. business argument. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That, so they're, 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 there's and um, what are we all excited about this year in our in football? Is the women going to the World Cup because they're going to play Route One or I just I just as a fan of the men. Team, I want to see us play good football and get to a final so we can be competitive at a finals. Whereas with Trapatoni, we played caveman football, we got to a Euros, and it was a disaster. Mm. Well, I will, I will give one it was two things about Trapatoni. A, he overtrained the team before the Euros, which he shouldn't have done. Also, we had four players there who were injured and actually weren't 100%. And those players, if they came in here, they'll tell you who they are, and they know who they were. They were exhausted. But I will say, two years earlier, John, we went to Paris and we stood up to French, uh, an excellent French team, yeah. and we won 1 0 over 90 minutes. It was the best performance of an Irish team. So that, to date, that could, like, be, that could that be done. A, it was the last best performance yeah, in Irish. That team, could be done, you know? and that was probably that was that was the last thing of a dying wasp of the Robbie Keane, Damien yeah. Duff, Richard Dunn, John O'Shea yeah. era. To, three years later, they were probably just a little bit past it. Like I, I, I don't have any issue with um, us like losing gallantly to a team that like they were talking about. We haven't qualified for World Cup in twenty years, and France were in the World Cup final in December. Yeah. I have an issue with us being underwhelming against Armenia at home and away, and also losing to Ukraine at home. And we need to improve in that that sphere yeah. before why, we can. That's take, why Greece. That's why Greece is. Greece, test, Greece you know? is everything. Greece is everything, is. and and uh, that'll be the proof of being. Greece is the word, John. Yeah, Gre- it is. Uh, <laughs> Michael Verney, <laughs> Gaelic Games. What do we got? A lot of stuff about Stephen Cluxton today. Yeah, uh, lots about Cluxton, John. Yeah, in nearly all the papers, I suppose. This was an absolute bolt from the blue last Sunday. There's no point in saying any different. Nobody, nobody, nobody was expecting. There's different views on it. Uh, Pat Spillane in the Sunday World, he just deals with it in maybe the first <laughs> five or six uh, paragraphs of his column. He just says, Imagine I wasn't alone in thinking it was April Fool's Day when news filtered through from Crow Park last Sunday that Stephen Cluxton was in the, in the Dublin squad. I know he's a superb leader and goalkeepers can operate well into their 40s these days. I know too that this could be the most open All Ireland Championship since 2010. So it's all about marginal gains. But I don't see why Cluxton couldn't just be added to the management team where his expertise would be invaluable. He goes on to say, I regard Cluxton's return as a joke. Now, Roy Curtis, uh, a couple of pages earlier, um, is on the opposite side of the fence and as a Dublin supporter, he's absolutely delighted to see him back. There's some great stuff in the mail as well. Uh, Mark O'Shea thinks that you know, Dublin having Cluxton back uh, could be, you know, yet another one of these marginal gains as Pat talks about. They have... They basically have the band back together now. Outside of Johnny Cooper. The McCaffrey, best. Mannion, Cluxton. Pat Gilroy. Is this because of Kerry? P- uh, possibly so. Um, they don't want Kerry to uh, maybe in any way affect their legacy. Now, I don't I don't think Kerry are going to go on a run like the Dubs went on or anything like that. Like Clifford will, will end up with a decent amount of All-Irelands, but I don't think he's going to end up with eight or nine or they're going to dominate the game or anything like that. But it's funny, uh, Mark O'Shea says in his column in the, the Daily Mail that he remembers uh, Paddy O'Shea saying that the, mo- the most... Uh, the most satisfaction he got from an All-Ireland outside of his first was the one in 84 where they'd been beaten in 82 by Offaly, they'd been beaten in 83 by Cork. Everyone was di- uh, kind of writing them off and they were back on top again. And I'd say Cluxton, uh, Mannion, McCaffrey and others are realising that, yeah, the ma- vast majority of them have eight All-Irelands um, but this is the chance to really, you know, even cement that legacy even further. Nine All-Ireland football titles, nobody has ever done it. Um and they're literally throwing the kitchen sink at it. And it's absolutely fascinating. It's fascinating from Desi Farrell's point of view that, you know, a manager, there'll always be a certain amount of ego in a manager. But, like, 
he's basically called on an All Ireland winning manager, the man that set the the train on the tracks with Dublin to come in and help him in the backroom team. Um, he's got McCaffrey back, who was never coming back. He's got Mannion back, who said he was never coming back. Cluxton hadn't played for Dublin in something like eight hundred and thirty days before he reappeared the other day. He played on Monday evening, I believe, against Mead uh, Mead Development Squad in a game. He could play today. He could play in the Leinster Championship. Um, I don't necessarily see it as him filling the breach or anything like that. I think it's uh, this is probably a conversation that happened a bit sooner than a couple of weeks ago. He was back training two or three weeks ago, um, but he's back in tow. I have to say as well, the fact that this was all kept under wraps and that nobody knew it was coming. Like the greatest footballer probably of his generation, the part, the player who. Um, basically reinvented how goalkeeping is played in Gaelic football and he's back training for two weeks and nobody realises he's involved in the Dublin squad until he walks out like that's amazing it shows how tight Dublin have gotten again that's that's Jim Gavin level of tightness oh, yeah. that's no word coming out that's the Omerta that we would have you know years ago you wouldn't hear anything until the day of a match um, and it was already an interesting football championship and this has made it even more interesting they, they do say though Mick Never come back. They do say that in sport as rule, as a rule, never come back. When you when you have your your legacy, when you have your medals, you have your titles, you have your honours, you have your golf majors, your Premier League medals, you have your your Cheltenham top jockey titles. Um, Shay Given came back. He retired from Irish football in twenty thirteen and came back and um, got injured and he went to twenty sixteen as a as a backup. Um, you think if Tom Brady came back, two more now maybe financially it was worth as well coming back. From, mm. um, but last year he was probably not the player that he was previous years. But he did okay the previous year, and he won a Super Bowl with with, with Tampa Bay. Um, David Russell has come back into into, jo- yeah. into, into the into the, into the National Hunt game, and we're still not quite sure are we going to see him at Aintree or Fairy House. Um, I, I find it struggling. It's it's an extraordinary talking point. Here we all are talking about it. It's extraordinary because and Stephen Cluxton doesn't talk, and he doesn't yeah. talk, which is his right. But he doesn't. So there's yeah. an enigma about the whole thing. Well, there's a couple of people you've mentioned there. Brady is one. In the type of position that Brady plays, he's obviously playing until he was 45. Yeah. Cluxton's position, it, it's okay if you lose a yard. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. You might even lose a yard off your kickout, I'd say, would be what you'd be more worried about. But it's not, uh, it's not as physically demanding as we'd say if he was out playing midfield or something like that. Another comeback, uh, just talking about never coming back. Liam Sheedy came back with Tip, yeah. won not Ireland. George Mike, Foreman. Mike, Michael Jordan. <laughs> you know? Tiger Woods. <laughs> Tiger yeah, Woods, yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, we are talking about a generational talent here. Um, and I don't think he will have missed a beat at 41. There is the, the, the whole question of... Or the dressing room, how the influence on the dressing room, the influence on the goalkeepers yeah. in the dressing what room. Yeah. About it, yeah. um, he's a very strong character. He would have been seen as Gavin's leader mm. in, the, in, on, in the Dublin setup. Uh, so he carries more weight than just the kick-out. Oh, big time. Oh, yeah, he carries serious weight. And I suppose David O'Hanlon, who's been very good in this, this year, Evan Comfort is obviously injured, and that's said to be one of the reasons why Cluxton is back in. And people are questioned, does it undermine him? No more than did Davy Russell coming out of retirement undermine Jordan Gainford or Sam Ewing and their possible opportunities in uh, in Elliot's yard. But... I don't. I don't know. I. I. I think. I think David O'Hanlon will grow from being exposed to training with someone like Cluxton, and he will only play if his performances in training or his performance in challenge games between now and whenever are up to the levels of David O'Hanlon's. If he's if he shows that he hasn't skipped a beat, and that's going to be fascinating to see. But his shadow will loom if he's not playing. Shall we say? I, I put it to you this way: If Dublin are playing and Cluxton is togged out but not playing. How much camera time will be spent on the Dublin More bench? More than Davy Fitz. I can't, be- I can't believe he's been brought back not to play. I have to assume he's, he's, the he's, there, he's there to play. The you know, you talk about goalkeepers as well. A lot of goalkeepers go past their 40th birthday. I mean, Roy Curtis makes a point that Buffon was winning the Italian league with Serie A when he was in his uh, 44th year. Peter Shilton played in the World Cup at 41 in 1990 and there was no diminution of his, of his, uh, his reflexes. Dino's off. Goalkeeper, Dino's off, hold, held the World Cup aloft in 1982 and he was an outstanding goalkeeper. So goalkeepers do go on that little bit longer. But I, I just find it intriguing. I was at the, the match last year with Dublin Hat and, and cheering on Dublin against Kerry in the semi-final and it was... It, it could have gone either way. It was an extraordinary game, but you you look at if you add what's into the Dublin panel this year who wasn't didn't play in that in that game. You Cluxton, you Mannion, you McCaffrey, Conor Callan missed that yep. game. If they all turn up and and they're on their blow and they're in the semi final again, and you have that those four players added to what you had last year. I know Johnny Cooper's gone. You think Dublin should be good enough to get a little bit further, a little bit further to the All Ireland final, and uh, comes All Ireland finals they sort of you know 
you, you couldn't back against them. I think it's wide open. You, you know football better than I do. You know, I, Kerry don't seem to be where they were a couple of years ago. Um, you know, Ulster football, you never know who's going to come out of that. Yeah. But the, and, and the perennial thing is, will, will Mayo ever get there, the red and green? And you know, their league form has been decent enough. Connacht have got some good teams. Do you see this as being a game changer? Can this get Dublin over the line? This year to make up for the last couple yeah, of years. Yeah, would have fancied them having a good chance of getting over the line anyway. Just anyway, with even McCaffrey, just with Clu- just with Mannion back, with Khan fit, hopefully you go down to their team potentially for a championship. You're looking at Cluxton, uh, Fitzsimons, uh, John oh. John Small, Brian Fenton, Merchant. Brian Howard, Owen Merchant, Conor Callaghan, Paul Mannion, Jack McCaffrey, Kieran Kilkenny. Like there's still ten of the best players in the game. Just what you mentioned, John, about the the dressing room dynamic yes. and the, par- mm. the possibility possibility of it, you know, undermining them. Mark O'Shea just says in his column here in the the Mail in 2009 when we were in a heap, Jack O'Connor came into training one evening and announced that Michael McCarthy was coming out of retirement and there was only oh, there was nothing only relief and not resentment. He came back. Uh, on the condition that he would not play in the full back line as good as he was he was never in love with playing there and he was an energetic presence in our half back line so six years later Emma Fitzmaurice brought back Paul Galvin some players were left looking over their shoulders but there was an acceptance that it was done to make the collective stronger Dublin have only done you know anything they, they've done anything they needed to make the collective stronger does this make the collective stronger to me it does even if it's only a matter of driving standards uh, people would say maybe that you know he won't play I'd be the same as Quinner I think you know if he's fit and impressing he plays but I think it uh, yeah it adds even more intrigue to uh, as Mark said there one of the most open you know all Ireland championships in about probably since 2010 I'd say this is the Sunday paper review on Off the Ball the Irish Independent Sports writer Michael Verney and the Irish Daily Mail sports reporter Philip Quinn uh, there's a lot of coverage of the Kelly Harrington exchange with our own presenter Shane Hannan from OTBAM earlier this week. So just to reiterate the facts, in October, Kelly Harrington retweeted a video from a Dutch commentator on GB News who spoke in a video about the murder of a child sacrificed at the altar of mass migration. Harrington said it was a powerful message by Eva Vlan Dingerbrook and added, our own leaders need to take a listen to this. She deleted her tweet, then refused to answer questions by Shane about the tweet. The, she then issued a statement following the interview with Shane to say that... Um, she was caught off guard. Um, she was moved by the horrific circumstances of the story. You reposted a video of a journalist together with a copy of a quote. My thoughts at the moment are of a young girl and not any political opinion. Having realised significance of my tweet and the hurt caused to a number of people, I immediately deleted the tweet. I engaged privately with a number of people who were hurt by the tweet and apologised to them. As a sporting role model, I'm aware I need to be mindful of what I do and I say. I react with my emotions without the facts. How this came across is not reflective of me as a person or my thoughts. So... What's your view on this, lads? Yeah, well, it could have been handled an awful lot better uh, from from Kelly's point of view, I would say. The the statement that she released that night is probably what she should have had ready to say if the question arose because it, you know it was always going to arise in time she's a she's a role model she puts out maybe something like that it's going to be going to be questioned especially you know because it was since deleted so i would essentially say she you know someone who's you know you mentioned it off air Quinn or someone who's always on guard in the ring letting their guard down in this type of scenario they had to know it was coming and particularly you know the PR handlers involved uh, and her advisors would have had to know it was coming I think it's kind of nipped in the bud with you know something like the statement she released uh, later that night if that was given on air whereas it kind of dragged on and it got uh, probably got a bit unnecessary I did interview today this is more of the statements during which I was caught off guard I was not prepared for question in relation to support my response the question asked was not definitive I do not want to gauge politically sensitive matters while I want to make clear is throughout my life both in boxing and outside boxing I've been lucky enough to have met many cultural multicultural influences and this continues to shape me to this day so a lot of coverage in the papers about it uh, Sean McGoldrick uh, I am quitting social media so this is before the interview with Shane slowly but surely I'm starting to detox off the social media world says Kelly it's a lifestyle choice there's a lot of negative stuff out there as well as positive stuff but I'm coming across a lot of the negative stuff as I said I'm out there uh, out of here starting with Facebook so she says she's quitting social media regardless before the interview even even was aired there's also a piece in the uh, Sunday Independent an Ireland thinks poll was Kelly Harrington justified in refusing to answer a question about her views on immigration arising from her social media post last year yes 44% no 30% 26% not sure and Eve Horn doing a piece um, just quoting that Rob Harnish who's a Dublin based CEO of networking company Sport for Business said that um 
Um, he also employs Harrington as a brand ambassador. Has the brand been damaged? Undoubtedly, she's taken a punch to the jaw on this one, but she's a boxer and sporting people know the resilience of being able to come back. I was talking to people who were talking to her. She's very upset when your people are critical of you in a knee-jerk way without any thought of the impact it might have on your mental health. That can be really hard. She's been through the mill. And he added, I think if Kelly had her time over again, she would have probably have chosen to answer the question in less of an emotional way. She'd have every right to ask. Shane did the question. And Kelly's views on this are important. I don't think her views are anything like they've been represented, but she could have explained that better and not just caught up in a social media pylon. That was in the Sunday Independent. We also have Ailish O'Hanlon in the Sunday Independent. Um, go around in Kelly's boxing gloves before you judge her. So the verbal sparring match that erupted last week around Kelly Harrington is not really about immigration. It's about class. Specifically, it's about the simmering disdain for the working class, which lies just under the surface of polite middle-class liberal discourse, ever ready to bubble self-righteously to the surface. She added in her piece, the people who decided Harrington's refusal to be badgered on immigration was unacceptable, invariably never seemed to put their own privilege under the microscope. And she added, the real question, of course, is why does Harrington have to answer these questions at all? I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, we have the... Uh, John McGee in the Sunday Independent. This is getting so much coverage, this, this story. The Kelly Harrington controversy, which may have another round to go, also shines a light on the increasingly uneasy and difficult terrain sponsors must navigate in a world that's become increasingly polarised when it comes to a wide range of societal and geopolitical issues. Should our sporting heroes and celebrities be allowed to have their own personal opinions, however misguided they may be, even if some people don't agree with them? It's the editorial of the Sunday Times as well. We have Ireland is still judgmental, only now it's done via social media. Just to get re read the last two paragraphs, the final issue raised by this week's contretemps is a question of what sports stars and sponsorship deals are permitted to say. Harrington is sponsored by the Spar, the supermarket chain. She was wearing a Spar hoodie as she was being interviewed. The problem is that a commercial organisation such as Spar does not sponsor her to be just anybody. It endorses her to be a symbol of a wholesomeness that will boost its brand. Uncomfortable political views are not what sponsors are paying for, as well as being champions in their field. We now require sports stars to be unblemished off it. Louise O'Neill, due to her success, Harrington's now a role model, presumably why Spar chose her to be a brand ambassador in the first place. With that, there are responsibilities. Perhaps it's unfair, but if Harrington wants to talk only about sport, why is she tweeting about political issues? If you're going to express your views on immigration and trans women in sport on a public platform such as Twitter, surely then you should be expected to ask about those views. In an interview, Eamon Sweeney has written about it, um, Michael Foley's written about it in the Sunday Times, plenty of opinions on this issue. Well, I think you've said it all, John. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> extraordinary. It really is. Um, just shows you. One tweet that was deleted six months ago, was it? October, yes. October. So it was, it was posted in October. And yet it surfaces again six months later. Uh, and it has caused, it has basically fed, fueled the columnists for the Sunday newspapers. Uh, uh, it just shows you the, the, the power, if you like, or, uh, of what Shane McGrath calls a, the, a vile cesspit. Twitter, um, you know, it's extraordinary. Uh, I, I'm with, I'm with, with Michael. I, I, I just think she dropped her guard, which is unusual for her. But um, look, she should have been prepared. She should have been prepared. The fact that the tweet was deleted at the time suggests to me that she knew she aired. So, and her people around her would have known she aired. So she should have had that prepared in the back of her mind. Is going to come up at some stage and be ready for it, and and she wasn't. And you know. But um, Shane Hannan did, he did what a good journalist do. You know, you try and blindside the person you're talking to. He had done his research. Um, I thought he, well, I thought I, he I, went I, about it in such a tactful way. Well, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't think there was any intent on him to ambush her or gotcha. gotcha. No, 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 I don't no, think no, so. No, 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 like, no. like, like, Ailish had asked why... Uh, uh, he, 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 like, first of all, he didn't badger... Uh, Kelly Harrington, Ailish O'Hanlon said that in the piece in the Sunday Independent today. He politely asked her a number of questions on the same topic and she ended the interview as is her right. She deleted the tweet. She gave her views, uh, you know, in the statement. Uh, as I'll just repeat it there again. Um, you know, I do not want to engage politically sensitive matters. I want to make clear throughout my life, both in boxing and outside boxing, I've been lucky enough, lucky enough to have many multicultural influences. This continues to shape me to this day. Um, and Ailish O'Hanlon also asked why he had to answer these questions at all. You know, she had to answer them. And she made it clear she does not want to engage politically sensitive matters. Well, nobody forced her to tweet the sentiments. Mm -hmm. She's also a heroine. She's an Olympic champion. She said in her statement she's a role model. For an organization spar that is paying her due to her status as a community role model, people look up to Kelly Harrington, right? So if there's an opaque nature to what she uh, has in terms of her views and maybe strong views in certain subjects, it's not surprising that somebody would want to ask about them. Now, she's a human being. She may have erred. Uh, we all need to move on in, in terms of it, but I don't think she was badgered. I think that it's fair game to ask a question uh, to a role model 
Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, and she doesn't, and she doesn't also have any kind of uh, obligation to answer it. Um, we are an organisation off the ball that has thousands of conversations. Most of them are completely positive, just based around sport. Like talking about Stephen County earlier on, your views, your different views. Um, some conversations can be emotional. Some conversations can be uh, difficult. Some conversations can be revealing. So Jerry Gilroy, six years ago, had a very difficult conversation with Cahill McCarran. We've had James Wiltane talk about sectarianism, which was revealing. We've had uh, Cyrus Christie talk about racism. We had Joe Malloy talking very emotionally with Liam Hayes, a very moving interview on suicide just a few weeks ago. I spoke to Jason Smith this week about a visual impairment, a disability, and being a Paralympian around that. A lot of these conversations are just run-of-the-mill. Sometimes there might be a difficult conversation. doesn't mean that Kelly Harrington's a bad person. doesn't mean that Shane Hannon's a bad person. It just means that you're having a conversation which went uh, got a little bit tense, a little bit awkward. It went viral, obviously, through Twitter. That is the medium of social media. Shane had, he felt, a right to ask her what her views were as somebody that is revered in society as an Olympic champion. She declined to answer those uh, questions, which is her right, uh, but therefore you're going to get a little bit of attention and heat on it. I think that's what the situation is here. John, you couldn't, I couldn't put it better. I mean, you've, you've actually just said it all very eloquently and you've put perspective to it. I think she's right to go off Twitter, by the way. I don't, I don't do it any good. I'm not, I'm not a great Twitter fan. I just think, you know, just play it safe, keep your guard up and move on. Um, I think she's learned a lesson. See, the funny thing about Twitter is, from a sports person point of view, particularly she's an amateur sports person, obviously, mm-hmm. as well, who's trying to like earn a crust out of it also as well. So it helps build her profile, which means when she puts out a message, be it a positive message for spa or otherwise, more mm-hmm. people see it. If you're not on social media, maybe you're less uh, attractive to some brands. Um, but at the end of the day, as regards, you know, the questions being asked. So that, that tweet was put out six months ago. Uh, it would be it would actually be tricky enough for a lot of boxing journalists who have regular dealings with her to talk about something like that in a normal setting. She was in you know this was a paid promotion essentially. So I I think you're you're fair game for things to be you know asked of you when you're in that type of position. And it was and as as Quinner said there, the fact that she deleted the tweet, she obviously had some uh, idea that she might have erred and they should have been well prepared for something to come, be it in November, December, or as it did you know earlier on this week. So I'm going to lob on across you there. Well, Katie Taylor got the same treatment. I think that's completely hypothetical. Okay, hypothetical. Yeah. We, love just, a, we love a bit of hypothetical. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just wondering, because Mick made a point there, like, uh, Kelly Harris is an amateur. She doesn't get paid. You know, she's not a, not a professional sports person. You know, and I, I just kind of think maybe am, our, our amateurs who people go in the morning and have, and have a day job, you know, maybe they, 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 they should be cut a little bit more slack, slack than professional sports people who are there 24-7. That's, you know, you mentioned, that's just an observation. Yeah, you know? so, so when we're talking about um, getting into the nitty-gritty of journalism with sports stars, maybe we need to differentiate between the GA player and the professional soccer player and the professional golfer and the amateur boxer. To a certain degree. We are all, inter- in sport, we are all interested. The profession has come on way ahead of the amateur. Yeah. When I started off in journalism, 30, 40, 1979, um, amateur sport got as much coverage as professional sport in newspapers, if not more amateur sport, particularly um, uh, amateur golf, for example. You, you, it would get 200 words in the paper or 400 words, and pro golf would get it one paragraph. So things have changed completely. We're all fascinated. Now, it's all, it's all about professional Premier League, Tiger Woods, Rory McIlroy, the rugby team has gone professional. We've seen that in our in our time. She's still an amateur, so I, I just kind of think maybe she should be judged slightly differently, in my humble opinion. My opinion, by the way, on GB News and Fox News America, these are not news organisations, so I believe they're right-wing propaganda channels. Uh, the sole objective of these organisations, in my opinion, is to turn a profit based on sowing division. So folks, don't get your news from GB News. Wow, they certainly <laughs> sold plenty of division anyway. Yeah. That, that'll be my strongly held view on Fox News and GB News, and I'm not left-leaning or right-leaning. I'll be quite a moderate in terms of my politics, and my politics are relevant to that. But I just think that there is a civil discourse that I think that is inflamed by certain organizations on, on social media, and, and you know that's just a, a personally held opinion. Now, there's a heartbreaking interview with um, David Walsh and, and, and yeah. Fergus Lattery. I'll get it for you there. I have uh, here. Here, here it is. So... He's got dementia. Fergus Lattery was a line. Um, it was capped many times for Ireland, over 60 times for Ireland, played in the South African Tour, played in the Barbarians game in 1973. Quinner will go into it a bit more, but this is, um, this is a heartbreaking read, really. It uh, is. It's, really, it's, a, it's a tough one to read, and even just 
the fact that he, he kind of doesn't really recognise David at the start, and I'm sure he would have had plenty of dealings down through the years, but you might go into it there, Quinner. There's some, uh, yeah, it's t- tough stuff, an important message to get out there, but it's uh, it's a tough yeah. read. But even the headline there, John, which says, this is Fergus Slattery, you know. Um, this was Fergus Lattery. This is not. This is this is Fergus Lattery, but it's not the Fergus Lattery that yeah. someone f- like me of my age uh, would have grown up with. You know, J.F. Slattery on the Irish rugby team. You know, uh, the Irish rugby team always had the initials of players. You had W.J. McBride, C.M.H. Gibson, you know, M.I. Keane, S.O. Campbell, and you had J.F. Slattery, who was a, a permanent in the, uh, playing the Irish rugby team for 13, 14 years, uh, and, and he's now seventy four years of age, and he has advanced dementia, and it's his family are finding it very difficult to cope. Um, but they've been very brave because they've come. They they want people. They're shining a light into dementia, and they're they're saying, "Look, we have it. Other people have it. This is how we're we're trying to move on as best we can." And it's a lovely piece by David Walsh. David is very good at these things. You know, he really he gets he gets under the skin of things. And you, can, you know, as as Mick says, when he goes to meet Fergus, Fergus doesn't know who he is. You know, and um, he, how he how he but doesn't know who, doesn't know who he is. And his wife talks about him whistling incessantly in the house and how how it's driving her driving her. Uh, she, she's very difficult. She's she's coping as best she can, but she knows. She says this is not the man that, that, that she married. The reason that Fergus Slattery has, has dementia, and he was one of the greatest flankers, he played in the Lions, an extraordinary record. He only lost one game in 25 appearances for the Lions. The famous Baba match in 73, the greatest try of all time, you know, scored by, by Gareth Edwards. You know, Slattery played in that match. You can see he's in that game. But this man, Fergus Slattery, one of the giants of Irish rugby, is struggling because, as the doctor is quoting it, he is suffering dementia as a result, almost certainly, of injuries he sustained while playing rugby. And that's something that's worrying for everybody who's playing the game now, and it's worrying for the, not just the RFU, but also the world world governing bodies. At 74 years of age, he's in very good condition physically, but mentally he's not in the right place and he doesn't know where he is. And that's because he has got some severe injuries. And they actually talk about it. There's a quote in one of the books here, and Walsh, Walsh quotes it, that he took a punch, he took this massive effing punch in his mouth, cracked a bunch of teeth down to the root. I was on the deck, concussed. I played on. After a while, the concussion started to drift away. Um... I didn't, uh, he said, uh, five minutes later, I'm running towards the goalpost and going, where the F am I? I didn't have a clue. I turned to Peter Dixon at the line out, where are we? And he says, what do you mean where are we are? We're in bloody Canterbury. It was a Lions match. I had no idea where we were. And that was written a few years ago. And things have got worse. And it is very sad because this man was a lion on the pitch. And, you know, he gave great service to Black Rock, to Ireland and to the Lions. And he's not the man that he should be at 74 years of age. But fair play to the family. They've been very courageous to shine a light into what's, I think it's, it's 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 described here, and there's an expression here which I thought was uh, which summed it all up. You know, dementia is the disease of the shifting sands, and um, his 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 very supportive family, his wife Margot, daughter Nikki, and son Cameron, have been very honest, very open, and they love they love their the love for their for Fergus is r- runs very deep. Uh, but it's a sad story, and it's it's very well told by by David Walsh and. Uh, I, I would recommend uh, having a read of it. And They're also saying because we well, all we yeah. all know somebody, by the way, Michael. And yeah. We all know somebody who's had dementia. You know, my mother had. It. We all know. Mm-hmm. All, everyone here, everyone listening in, knows what the Slatteries are going through. And they just say as well that they don't bear any ill will towards the rugby no. union. Now that's for for guys who are probably in their forties. It's probably a little bit different. That are you know we all know of certain ex you know professionals that are suffering similar kind of effects at a young, at a younger age but i think this is just to kind of get the message out there um it's it's a hard it's a hard read but it's uh it's an important one as well and just one thing because fergus isn't quite sure what's going on they have to keep an eye on him so the family now have apple trackers attached to his, his keys so what if he because he wakes up in the middle of the night and goes out for walks so they know where he is so his wife margo she says here she um sleeps with his and her keys under the pillow so um that these are the keys uh uh, which if he if he goes walkabouts and um, she also hides the kettle at night in case he gets up and scalds himself you know it's it's a moving very uh, human uh, insight into how a family is coping with advanced dementia and the dementia is is it's they have you know, the medical definition of it here this is really one of the worst ones you can get it's called frontal lobe dementia and there is no cure for this dementia so Fergus J.F. Slattery is 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 struggling and um, his family are having to struggle along with him and it's it's very well written and I have to say the family come out of it has been really really strong and they're they're heroes they're heroes for a man who was a hero mm-hmm. for Irish rugby and and um, for me growing up in the seventies um, you know Slattery was immense and it's 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 sad and you you wish them and you wish them all the very best going forward and um, you know they say also say that when he passes away they're going to devote his they're going to uh, pass his brain on to uh, Trinity College for 
um, so it can be examined and maybe provide a way forward so that other people won't have to yeah. go through what they're going through, which is a, is a very humane gesture. And just on dementia as well, like, you know, some of the most cherished things we all have in our lives are memories. Memories with... Yeah. Memories that we've... Things have, we've done ourselves, memories with loved ones. And, you know, his family just would crave that he, that he would remember, you know, things that have happened. But that because of, you know, the effects of the, the illness, he, he doesn't remember anything. And it's, it's fascinating just to hear how his wife has done with the keys and that just to make sure how he has to still look after him. It's, uh, yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's a tough one. It's a tough one, yeah. yeah. This was a man who could do the, do the crossword every day before matches. Very bright man. Um, but I have to say, people at Black Rock College, from reading that, they were, that's where he went to school and he goes to the matches. And uh, from what I gather, they, they've been a great support down there and they still are. So, uh, fair play to them. But the great J.F. Slattery, anybody who never saw him play, get onto YouTube and watch him. He was one of the greats. It's very brave from the family and it's heartbreaking read. And it's the daily tasks that he engages in that, that is kind of, that's a tough part of the interview to read. And the fact that they don't, he's not the same person, really. No. That's, 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 that's hard. That's really, really hard. Yeah, it is. It, it is. It is very difficult. And as I say, I think all of us here, people listening in, we all have been affected by dementia. We all know someone in our family, and someone who isn't the person that we knew when they were getting to the later parts of life wasn't the person that we knew early on. And uh, and that's the same with, with Fergus Slattery. But um, it's a little, the pictures are lovely, and uh, you know he, he he looks. in That's the thing about status. Dementia. You you look fine. You look fine. It's just. Um, inside the brain is, is not what it used to be and it's it's very sad but I have to say the family come out of this very well they've been very brave and they've shone, shone a light on uh, this as I say the disease of the shifting sands that, that's going to be with us for a long time to come yeah, well. HIA and stuff like that as at least the, the developments in it within rugby in particular like I was looking at the, the Grand Slam game and you're just think, thinking if somebody hits the sending off and a few other di- different hits and you're just thinking at least you know, the brightest of lights has been shone on this type of thing now to make sure that, you know, similar people, you know, people, other rugby players and other sportsmen and women don't suffer a similar fate in, in later life. I think they have changed the rules on rugby. You can't go above the, yeah. the, the head high tackle is gone. Like Fergus, when he when Slats played, it was, you know, so there was the, fa- the famous, there. was a Code 99, Willie John McBride, you just turned to the guy nearest you and you, and you decked him. You know, that, that's, rugby was played under a different set of rules then. Mm. Um, and I'd say he's not the only one. I think a lot of rugby players of his, of his ilk uh, have, have, are suffering similarly you know but uh, as you say I think the game has moved on there's more protection for players so hopefully there'll be less of these stories in the future Yeah well said well said Philip and, and Michael Michael where do you want to move it on to next? Uh, Michael Dignan did a piece about uh, where Hurling is at the moment which is now I don't necessarily uh, agree with him so it's always good to bring up an alternative opinion as well but he's kind of just talking about uh, the Limerick and Tipperary game last Saturday night and he just said game is losing its appeal in flurry of rooks and malls and he's just talking about um, how the game has changed maybe so significantly from his own playing days now he still has Lots of admiration for what's going on and, you know, how skillful the games are and how, you know, physically uh, imposing a lot, of pl- a lot of the players are. But he's just talking here to say, he says, I've no problem saying that while I enjoyed aspects of their semi-final win, it was like a rugby international. There must have been more rooks and malls than Ireland's Grand Slam encounter with England. It was all a bit stop-start with big hits, the physio running on and the players battering each other off uh, over, uh, bat- battering each other over rook ball. A part of it is down to backroom teams and how management are feeding off all the statistics being generated, particularly in terms of retaining possession. It's all about not giving the ball away or even playing 50-50 balls, which used to be a staple of the game in terms of individual contests. This is all contrary contributing to the way the game has been played. Now, he still has great admiration for the likes of Barry Nash, who's reinvented the, the corner-back role, and say Decton Hannon, who's reinvented uh, the, the centre-back role. But he does see some problems. With it. He just said that he's referring to a, a tweet Jackie Tyrrell put up and said, Jackie Tyrrell posted a photo from uh, the second semi-final between Kilkenny and Cork in Nolan Park, which hardly had any players uh, in one side of the field. He's not long retired, and he says he hardly recognises the game now. That is a common team, and even if you look, you go to any Gaelic football match or look at uh, any Gaelic football match on telly, and you'll see it on telly today, you will basically, Dublin and Derry, you will basically see when the ball is in Dublin's half and Derry are attacking, Dublin will have nearly every player behind the ball, mm. and Derry will have the vast, vast majority of players there, and you're playing it over and back across the pitch. It's something that we could never have imagined have seen maybe 10 years ago. Hurling has moved on quite a bit as well. I have to say, uh, a good Hurling match to me is still... Uh, on you know, like unparalleled yeah, I, I, I don't see anything like it um, Michael just says here as well this is in his Daily Mail column it's not going to change back 
we're going more and more down that route but that's going to make it harder for teams who can't produce these 6 foot 5 giants basically in reference to a lot of you know massive Limerick players that they have the likes of Hegarty and Hayes what sets Limerick apart is that they have hurling in abundance to go with all that power uh, with wonder- wonderfully skilled players and yet Limerick are not set up to score loads of goals they're happy to outpoint you like they did with Tipperary so much for so much of the semi-final Limerick have kind of reinvented the terms of engagement in hurling now uh, and a lot of teams think that they need to score goals against them because Limerick will just put up a 30 point tally in most games Is that good for Hurling Mick? That Limerick are, are, are I'm, I'm looking from the outside they seem to be doing now what Dublin did with, with the six in a row they seem to be physically at a different level and they can also hurl when they have to you know mm. are, they, are they here for the long haul and if they are is that good for Hurling? They're definitely here for the long haul um, I put it to you this way the best matches every year the last three or four years have all been Limerick games right. they've all been involved in Limerick something similar to probably the Dubs maybe the Dubs Kerry the Dubs Mayo um, they're definitely forcing teams to go to another level uh, and can they? at the moment there's not there's not a load of teams jumping up and down here thinking these are going to take Limerick down um, they're just they're, they're in that sweet spot at the moment where Dublin were probably around 2018 mm. 2019 and they don't look like they're going to be stopped I have to say I thoroughly enjoy Limerick's games and as I said if you go back to the last couple of years the best games last year's Munster final last year's All-Ireland semi-final last year's All-Ireland final they've all involved Limerick um, taking the game to another level and that's forced other teams to try and get up to that level as well they're falling short but they're they're making progress I'd say I don't enjoy the game as much as I used to Hurling. Hurling, yeah, I don't it, enjoy it. It's because, yeah, it's a lack of abandon, John. It doesn't, it's, yeah, it's a lot it's, less free speed. There's not as I much I think there are too many scores to in the game. Now, maybe that's the, the pairs have just got much more skillful, but I don't know if there's something with the boss of the hurl or the ball. It just seems to be a lot easier from inside your own half to hit a long range point than it used to be 20, 30 years ago. The chaos is gone, that midfield battle, the claustrophobia of the whole thing, which I saw in that Munster final last year between Limerick and Clare in the mm. difficult conditions, that just complete um, tension. I think it's gone a little bit out of the game. It's it's too. It's like one of these um, video games. It's back forth, back forth, point here, point here, and goals mean less than they did. And for me, that that it, like if you scored a goal in the Ireland final in the eighties, nineties, that was generally the winning of the game. That's because you're saying teams can now score 25, 26, 28 yeah, points. Yeah, and I just feel that it's a little bit tit for tat, ding dong. The goals are um, less important, and the chaos and the physicality, it it, it, it it's just too. It almost it's too robotic and machine like for me now at the moment maybe that's uh, I'm looking at through a romantic tin tin lens and you've got a much better uh, understanding of the game than I do having played it for awfully make but it's just my kind of well, he, he wore a long coat and belly cram that was for Wicklow actually Quinner. that was even oh, more, wor- worse again well, you're <laughs> <laughs> uh, so like, if, what you're saying there John is uh, players are much stronger much more physically developed now the, the boss of the hurl is as a bigger sweet spot than it would have had years ago if you compare a hurl from the 90s to a hurl from now they're, they're chalk and cheese the the sweet spot on a hurl from years ago is tiny if you got it on the sweet spot you were perfect but now the sweet spot is much bigger uh, and you also have then as well like the ball to me the ball is not fit for, fit for purpose at the moment it's just it's basically travelling too far and a bit like golf yeah I think so yeah but like you can make a golf course you can make a hole longer you can't, you know, unless you're making a pitch bigger, the ball is still going to travel far too far. Like you can, if players scoring from their own forty-five now, if players scoring from their own sixty-five with a wet ball, which is unheard of, it would have been an achievement twenty years ago to score sixty-five. Now it's like if they wanted to, they could puck at another sixty-five and maybe another ten or fifteen on top of that as well. So that's that. I I, I do have my the bo- the ball and the weight of the setter is a big bugbear. I have heavier? to say, or a, yeah, not, not not a massive amount heavier, but a small a small bit would make a big difference. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I always say maybe when I can puck the ball over the bar from the middle of the field, there's something a bit wrong because I wouldn't. <laughs> I wouldn't have a. Great, that's my point. Yeah. That just lessening the uh, enjoyment of the game that I would have had. Yeah. Twenty thirty. Years Gary ago. Neville even put a pint over from sixty five and crawl packed there a few weeks ago. And I'm gonna. I I I said I wouldn't. I was gonna tweet it, but I didn't. I, I, what you tweet. I, I have I have an issue with the boys from the overlap were over right, and they had Keane and Carraher oh, and Neville, yeah. Neville in Crow Park taking shots, and yet Crow Park won't let club teams or county teams. Uh, the week before a match walk on the pitch and yet these three boys were able to because it, it suited them that's that's a, a big bugbear of mine I have to say before we played the club final in 08 we were allowed to walk on the sideline and we weren't allowed onto the pitch because you're not allowed onto the pitch yeah. you're not allowed onto the pitch unless you're a celebrity when, when, it's, when, it, suit, when it suits them um, I have to say that that did annoy me even though the video to Pow was comical enough now in fairness 
This is Sunday paper viewing off the ball of the Irish Independent Sports writer Michael Verdi and the Irish Daily Mail sports reporter Philip Quinn. We're going to kind of finish off the uh, the chat this hour, lads, with the Masters. Um, starts next Thursday at Augusta in Georgia, the first golf major of the year. Rory McIlroy, Shane Larry, uh, Patrick Harrington, Seamus Power. Um, well, Patrick obviously has to win in Texas uh, this evening to get into it. But um, we've another amateur as well. We've a, a young lad, don't we? Um, McLean, is it? Yeah, McLean, yeah, 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 yeah. Who's, who's involved? He won the mid amateur, I think. Um, Paul Kimmage has written a, a big spread with Shane Larry today in the Sunday Independent he has yeah Paul is, I think Paul headed over there on Friday I was talking to him at the, the game the, the soccer match of the night uh, the French game yeah um, gets on well with Shane this looks like it's a, it's a Q&A done over the phone I would think um, interesting he asks Shane about the breakup with Bo Martin which I think is a, a significant part of, of Lowry's um, I think well, Lowry, Martin was there for a success you know they won the Open together they won the um PGA went for together. They played. They were in the Ryder Cup together, and now he doesn't have this guy, this big bearded guy, on his bag. And, and he just asks him about it. And Larry does say that the breakup was a kind of unexpected, at least for me. He says this was Larry. So Larry is saying it was unexpected from his point of view, which would suggest that actually it was Martin who initiated the break. Um, and you know, last year at Augusta, they they had a they had a not quite a set two, but there was a, a very audible uh, conversation that was picked up. Uh, I think it was on the. I think it was the fifteenth hole, and Larry was laying up on the Saturday, the third round, and he he made he criticised Martin for the yardage he was given because he said he should have been nearer. He was too far back, and he kind of and the, and they they clearly there was a disagreement, and then we asked Shane about it afterwards. And he said, "Ah, sure, we're always having fights in the course, or it's only a bit of banter, so we're grand. We move on very quickly." And they did; they have moved on very quickly. But the fact that Larry says it was unexpected, at least for me, would suggest that. It was Martin who decided to initiate the breakup. So Larry's going in there with Darren Reynolds, who uh, he's had before in his bag temporarily. And um, I don't think Shane is playing as well as he did uh, this time last year. Um, he actually says, if I can get it right between my ears, I'll perform well. I think all golfers will tell you, of all handicaps, if you get it right between your ears, um, all sportsmen and women will say that as well. I don't fancy him this week. Um, I think he needs to keep calm. I'm not sure... Uh, if his game is as sharp as it was this time last year but he's a beautiful uh, chipper of the ball from around the edge of the greens those runoff areas of which there are loads at Augusta and if he can hold a putt or two early on he have to say last year I was there and I was very fortunate to be there for the Irish Daily Mail and um, Shane came third and he was brilliant for us all week Tell us what it's like. Okay, what it's like. Okay, well, I, that's my cue. He actually, on the Saturday, John, I'll tell you, it was cold on the Saturday, third round. We were all wrapped up in warm. I was the only person wearing shorts, like the fool that I was. And uh, it was about eight or nine degrees. And Larry's about to go out in the second last match. And he's just looking across to see when the when the uh, tea is clear. And he, and he catches my eye on the putting rain and he calls me over. And uh, I'm looking around. He's, me, yeah, come over, come over, he says. And he said, I heard you got pulled out in the draw. Only, this is only, the draw had only happened about an hour or so earlier. There's a media draw, you get pulled out. Tell you, the odds are about 40 to 1. And I don't back many of those winners, John, neither do you. But I got pulled out, and he knew about it, because someone had put it up on social media, and he'd seen it. And he said, uh, good luck on Monday at Augusta. And I said, uh, thanks very much, Shane. Good luck for you over the weekend. He said, thanks very much, Philip, I appreciate it. So um, he had a good weekend. He ended up coming third. But he finished his round, John, on the Sunday. He... Um, if you remember, he was going really well in the last day. Okay, Sheffield was miles ahead. He did a triple bogey. But he triple bogey on the one, two, three. It was the, the fourth, fourth hole, yeah. yeah. And uh, he was, you know, looking at the leaderboard. He'd come third. He was all, yeah, third. I, I couldn't have caught Sheffield. You know, Rory came with a charge. Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. And he goes, uh, Philip, anyway, tomorrow he says, don't do what I did on the fourth hole. Don't take a triple, you know. So I'm playing the fourth hole now. I'm playing the the next day. I'm at Augusta. And I'm playing. I have my caddy John Chance. Great name for a caddy. And I said, "This you is the caddy." I had a caddy. Oh, caddy in the white overalls and all. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Big oh, business. the very part. Yeah. Oh, I'll tell you the whole day. You know, your the, the golf balls are waiting for you on the range. You're buggy down to the range. Your clubs were cleaned. My clubs didn't know what was going on at all. In fact, they weren't my clubs. I had to borrow. Oh yeah, I had to borrow clubs, John. Here's a story for you. I had to borrow clubs to play in Augusta because Saturday lunchtime. Suddenly, I'm told I'm playing in Augusta. And I had no clubs. And there were clubs in our house. So we asked we asked the man whose house we were renting any chance we could borrow these clubs. And we had a look at them. They look very fancy. They're quite decent clubs. Uh, they look too good for me. He said, Delighted, he said. But just take a picture of those clubs at Augusta because I'd love to have them for my friends and oh, show the picture. Yeah. So we took plenty of pictures of the clubs. Turned out this guy who owned the clubs had been in University of Georgia and he had played in, in InterVarsity or NCAA. It was inter, inter, varsity Golf. And he played against Scotty Scheffler. The clubs that I played with had played in the same tournament as Scotty Scheffler. I only found that afterwards. They were downgraded. Oh, they were downgraded <laughs> that day. But anyway, we came to the fourth hole in Augusta. And I, by the way, have started off at a double bogey the first. Now I've gone par par, John. I'm, I'm kind of smelling myself here. I'm on the fourth tee. And I said, Larry took a six here. Now I have to beat Larry. I said, whatever you do, couldn't I beat Larry, you know? Oh, the snap hook left into all sorts of rubbish, I don't know, sort of vines and trees and all that. And I went, oh no. Went in, found it, took a penalty drop. 
pitched up and then I had to hold a little knee knocker for a five and I, and I went in and I went that's made my day I beat, I beat Shane Larry on the six <laughs> bit of, bit of, but uh, as it turned out I couldn't complete the whole round because we had there was flights and issues and they wouldn't give me an early tea time you had to play when you, you had to play late we couldn't play early so I had to come out of 13 holes but I got as far as Amen Corner and uh, I have to say Amen brought me to my knees but it was it was a great experience and I really enjoyed it and I felt very privileged to have been there A to been there all week for the, the cover of the paper see Larry, McElroy come second and Larry come third and then and then also then to get drawn out to play you know a 40 to one shot so um, yeah I can say I played 13 holes at Augusta and uh um, what do we not see about the Masters uh, on TV? Well, that, yeah, that, people that, are on top of the hills, and there is yeah, really, yeah. but you know they don't realise it. There's more of the experience even. Yeah, but also um, the first tee, the ninth green and the 18th green, they're all on a hill, and there's not a bush anywhere. It's just like a tee and, t- uh, and, and two greens cut into a hill. It's not, not a bush, not a shrub, nothing. It's a very strange place. You say, why are they putting greens and tees there? Um, what, what, else, what did I enjoy about it? The great thing was, because we were, we were competitors, we were allowed into the clubhouse which you weren't allowed during the week, even with your press badge. So we were allowed into the, into the clubhouse and you were allowed into the champion's locker room. So I'm thinking, I'm going to get somebody well-known here now. I'm going to get... Well, I get Nicholas. Well, maybe I might get Tiger Woods' locker room. I'll settle for, I'll settle for Seve Ballesteros. Anyway, I went in. I'm looking for my... And I'm checking who I got, you know. And uh, Craig Stadler. <laughs> <laughs> the walrus. The walrus. I'm almost yeah. as white as himself. And I went, freaking hell, Craig Stadler. And... Um, I didn't mind. He won an eight. He won. A, he won an eighty-two. He's so, more green so jackets than you have. He's more green jackets than I have. I was. I was the greenhorn. Um, but that was a great pose. And you're kind of looking around the locker room. The locker, and the locker room's tiny. The, the, the Chapman's locker room, you know. And I took a picture or two and all that. But uh, I didn't actually. I may even post on social media. There you go. But it was a wonderful experience. I played with a, an Oriental gentleman uh, who's a tall man from Japan. Uh, uh, a very nice man I played with a, an excitable um, Mexican and I played with an American guy from some local t- cable network some TV guy and this guy annoyed me a little bit John because he couldn't play golf and here he was he put his name in the draw I got drawn out but he couldn't play the game ah, that's, so this is yeah, like someone Robert going, to, go, someone else, going yeah. to the centre court at Wimbledon or going to um, Crow Park and, and, they, and they don't know how to hold the, hold the hurl and he just kept taking videos and the videos and his caddy wasn't able to get him to actually basically the caddy just said to him just put away the driver take an 8 or 9 iron and just get it down there and then he'd pick the ball up and he'd go to the green and he'd have a few putts and I'm thinking what an awful waste this could have been a guy you know not, I'm not a great golfer I'm whatever I was 15, 16 handicap or whatever it is but there's a guy who was a a non-golfer and here he was getting to tread the fairways mm. you know um, but it Can was I ask you a genuine question, you can ask a genuine question. If, if, if your ball was put on the edge of every green on each hole would you come around in less than par or more than par if the oh. you, yeah, if the ball was put on the edge of the green and all you had to do was take three or four shots. You're talking about the putting surface. Yeah, the putting yeah, surface, yeah. yeah. Put, like because no. the ball accounts, it's like glass, is it? It's glass, and, and there are the extraordinary slopes. And but having been there for for the whole week and watched walked every cor- every hole, you actually have an idea where the slopes okay, are. Yeah. The one bit of my game that isn't bad is I can actually read. This sounds terrible. I can actually read greens. Okay, okay. my problem is actually getting there <laughs> with the same ball that I've left the tee with because yeah, I yeah. generally have lost it at some stage off the tee. What's the experience like for so, for fans? Anybody you like at the trip of a lifetime to go um, to Augusta? I met the loads Masters. of Irish people over there, John. Yeah. Actually, uh, there's a good Irish crowd there. Uh, Brendan Dillon, UCD, former League of Ireland um, uh, chairman, was there, and, and, a, and a few other people I met. Um, it's it, it, like like journalists. Mostly, when you cover an event, you're privileged to walk inside the ropes. At Augusta, you're not. You're outside the ropes. Um, but there's loads of se- seating areas around, and even though your name might be on the seat, and the name. You can actually, have, the seat's empty. You can sit there until someone comes along and says, would you mind me, can I have your seat? Yeah, you can. So you can actually sit at the backs of the greens. There are actually good viewing areas. Uh, and one thing as well, it's actually quite a small property, John. It's actually not that big. Okay. You can actually you can actually walk around it quite quickly. Um, one thing that caught me out, one little story. I was down there and I got caught short. I hope I'm allowed to tell the story, John. I got caught short. Just, just make sure it's not oh, No, no, it's all good. And uh, I had to go for a wee. And, uh, and I went to the restrooms. And there's two queues. And one queue is moving quicker than the other. And I said, what queue am I supposed to go in here now? I think I'll go for the queue that's moving. So there was a gentleman there who was one of the, uh, one of the, one of the sort of uh, staff men in the course. And I looked at him and I said, what queue should I get into? And he goes, are you front nine or back nine? And I went, sorry, are you front nine, sir, or back oh, nine? Oh, what a question. And I went, I'm front nine. They'll go to that queue. John, I hope I got away with that one. Sorry. So I stood, <laughs> the, did, front, I stood did, in the front nine did, queue, and I, and I was in now. But that was very good. Everything on the course, they don't have, you never smell. <laughs> Every, I love that little golf references <laughs> yeah, yeah. in literally in everything that's nine. going on. I yeah. love that. You don't have, you never smell a burger or a chip or a fry at Augusta, because they won't allow them. They don't like those things contaminating the air. But you can you can buy your, your sandwiches and your salads, and they're all very reasonable. It's like the, the pimento cheese sandwich, had it once wouldn't be going there again but they're all very reasonable I, I have to say I got a great buzz out of it and one thing I did notice after Tiger Woods the Americans have only one golfer that they like to follow Rory McIlroy they right. adore him and that might be our cue in to talk about Rory's chances John well how is he going to get on well he has to start fast 
Yeah, that, that was like uh, Paul Kimmage in his piece talks about well Shane Larry about his uncle, which is an uh, interesting read about Brandon. Uh, Brandon Brandon's, bro- Brandon's brother, you know, yeah, Jimmy, yeah, uh, Jimmy, yeah. yeah that, was, uh, that was very emotional for the Lowry's, uh, yeah. and, and also about the Thursday of Augusta being the hardest day of the year. Uh, that you have to get off to a good start uh, on the day one of the Masters. You can't be chasing, as Rory's found to his cost. Well, I did a bit of research on this. Rory's fourteen Masters so far. This is his fifteenth. His average first round score is a little bit under seventy two. The winner's average Thursday score is three strokes lower. So on average, after the first day on. Augusta, Rory is, whoever's going to win it, he's three strokes behind him, so he's playing catch-up. You know, he came with a charge last year and everybody was blown away by this, you know, he shot a 65 or 64 on the last day, 64? 64. 64 on the last day, the bunker chip at the 18th, you know, but he, he was a freewheel 64. He teed off, you know, 10 strokes behind Sheffield, he wasn't going to catch him. He lost it on day one. You know, his, he, too often, I'm looking at it here, uh, the last four opening rounds down at Augusta, 73, in 2019, 75 in 2020, 76 in 21, and 73 last year. You know, you're out with the washing. You so, won't win it, but you can lose it. And he has lost and on has, day one. Yeah. On day one, so he has to start fast. And if he does start fast, you know, he's, he's got every chance. Um, you know, I think he's in a good place. I thought he changed it to Shaft was driver at the World Match Play. He changed his putter. He played seven matches, won six of them, including taking out Scheffler in the third and fourth playoff. He should have beaten Cameron Young in the semi-final. He should have won it, but he was excellent. And I think he's in a very good place. I think there's no excuses. The only guy for me has got to watch is Scheffler, who's just, you know, he's a machine. Uh, I don't think the live guys are going to contend. They're, they've been playing 54 hole, no cuts, you know, once every four weeks. I don't think their, their game's going to be sharp enough. Um, I think this, 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 is, this is Rory's year. Mind you, I think we've all been saying that for a few years. But yeah, everything is in place. Dermot Lee's talking in the Sunday Independent about how you have to win to order, like Jack Nicholas did. You can't win it on the basis of feel or when you feel like it. So you have to have a certain focus for major championships. Thought that was interesting in Dermot Gleeson's piece. Also, Paul McGinley interviewed in the, or kind of doing a guest column in the Sunday Times, talking about Rory's improvement with his wedge play and also working with Bob Bertella, the psychological guru uh, that worked with Padre Harrington a few years ago as well. So uh, lots of kind of subplots around it. Are you going to pick a winner? Before we finish the Sunday paper review, Philip Quinn. Pick a winner. Um, well, I, th- I think yeah, I'm 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 with the wee. I call him the wee ice man, uh, which is sort of that's a little. That was what Ben Hogan used to be called, and I think Rory is is our wee ice man, and I think uh, his time has come. Michael Verney, will you be watching the Masters? Uh, I, I, it's one of these scenarios where I don't have the channels anymore, unfortunately. Right. So I'll find somewhere to watch Sunday evening. All right. A dodgy um, box, no. No, <laughs> no, 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 not quite. But uh, it's no longer on the the highlights are no longer on BBC, BBC sure that's right, yeah. which uh, which I wouldn't be a big fan of either now. But um, yeah, I definitely watched the Sunday. As I said, growing up, nineteen ninety six was it? Yeah, yes. Faldo and Norman, some oh, great yeah. memories. There's nothing like it. Um, last thing I'd ask you, Quinner, if you're trying to follow somebody there, is it difficult? Like, say, if you were trying to follow a tiger yeah. or something like that, are you able to see them for every hole, or do you have to go a couple of holes ahead? Or they only let so many people in, Mick, and okay. because the property isn't very big, actually. You Yes, you can follow anybody. Okay, you can, you, you, and, mo- and you can go ahead a little bit and get a pitch and say there's loads, there's loads of seating areas. But actually, it's it's not a it's not a difficult course to f- to follow somebody. Yeah, you, yeah. you can get you can get a pitch and. Uh, yeah, I wish I was there this week. And uh, you mentioned Paul Kimmage has gone over, and my good friend Vinnie Hogan and Dennis Kerwin, a few colleagues, Philip, Philip Reed, Greg Allen have been covering the Masters for years. N- Many good golfers have fallen short, John, in the Masters. Like some guys, I was at a piece for the Mail now for next week. Some really great golfers, like you know, like Weisskopf and Lee Trevino and, and Johnny Miller, Ernie Els, David Duval. Lots of great champions couldn't crack the Augusta code. You know. Just hope that's not Rory. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Who's going to win the league finals today? Derry, Dublin, Mayo, Galway. Uh, I think Dublin will beat Derry. And I wouldn't be surprised to see S. Cluxton in goals. Um, I think Mayo will just about edge it. Difficult one. They're playing championship next week. But I think that's crazy, isn't it? Ah, to me, no, like that's, and, bo- and that's bonkers. John, there is no competitions, sport and competitions, where you punish the higher achievers, where you're essentially punishing winners. So they've been punished for getting to a league final by the proximity of their next game. It's madness. It makes it makes no sense whatsoever. And that's where we need to either if it's getting rid of preseason competitions or uh, you know, extending it somewhere by another two weeks. That's where we need to buy a couple of weeks to make sure that sort of scenario doesn't happen. Same thing happens with, with Sligo, who won uh, Division Four last night as well. And nice to see Red Oak Murphy. Uh, you know, the tributes to him as well. Yeah, years since he passed, and it was nice to hear uh, Niall Murphy, the captain, talking after and how days like that and you know scenes like playing big finals in Crow Park were were made for him. And there was a, a very you know I think his parents put out uh, you know a few different messages about you know raising awareness about about suicide and things like that in the last couple of days, and it's a hugely important message to get out there. 
and just someone who has, did pass away during the week, and, and, and I think it was mentioned in the papers earlier on, but Jimmy Gray, 90, in his 93 years of age, a legend of Dublin GAA, and also Lencer and Iron GAA. He, he appointed Hef on 74, he played for the Dubs in the hurling, uh, played in the All-Ireland Final in 61, he was a Leinster chairman, founder of Nafina, an extraordinary man, he gave, he gave a life um, service to, to, to GAA, uh, Dublin, Leinster, and uh, Jimmy is sorely missed. Okay, well said, Philip. Michael, thank you so much. Cheers, John for coming in today giving us your insight on the Sunday paper review enjoy the rest of your day speak soon we're back at one o'clock on your radio on News Talk on Off the Ball we've got two live and exclusive Premier League commentaries to bring you first up West Ham versus Southampton Richie McCormack and Brian Kerr describing that one then Stephen Doyle and Kenny Cunningham provide the call in the match between Newcastle and Man United if you missed any of this Sunday paper review you can check out the podcast on the Off the Ball section of the Go Loud Network also available wherever you get your pods you can also watch it back on the YouTube channel for Off the Ball we'll return on your radio at one we'll chat then thank you